Far East Broadcasting Company Philippines in partnership with Christ's Commission Fellowship bring you a message from the Word. Good day everyone and welcome to our last Sunday of 2021. Imagine how quickly time has gone by. Well, from our family to yours, a belated blessed Christmas and an advanced greeting for a blessed new year. I'd like to begin by asking you a question. What is the most expensive Christmas gift that you've ever heard of? Well, someone sent me a source and it listed down quite a few, quite a few ostentatious Christmas gifts allegedly given by people to their loved ones. I'll just give you a couple of examples. One time, a Russian billionaire gave his daughter an apartment. You might say, wow, that's an expensive gift. But wait, this was an apartment in Manhattan reportedly worth 88 million U.S. dollars. Wow, folks. I mean, my calculator can't even count that high. Let's go for something a bit simpler and more modest. What about the famous American boxer who gave his wife for Christmas a bathtub? Well, you might say, that's kind of okay, reasonable, but wait. This bathtub was made of 24 karat gold and was worth only about 2.3 million US dollars. Well, folks, today's message is about a gift. It's about heaven's priceless gift. What is so special about this gift? I'll tell you in just a moment. The message about heaven's priceless gift will reveal to us that this gift is something we all desperately need. It's also something that we will all be glad to receive ourselves. But unfortunately, it's something that sometimes we find difficult or even refuse to give to other people. What is this priceless gift from heaven that we desperately need, will be happy to receive, and yet sometimes we find difficult or impossible or refuse to give to others? Let me tell you what it is. Heaven's priceless gift is forgiveness. And this is what today's message is all about. We're going to be looking at the last parable for this year, and it's all about heaven's priceless gift of forgiveness. But before we go into the parable, let's listen in on a conversation between Jesus and the Apostle Peter, and I would say within earshot, the rest of the disciples. Here is how that conversation went. In Matthew 18, verses 21 to 22, this is what we read. Then Peter came and said to him, that's Jesus, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. Now, why in the world was Peter even asking this question? You see, the background of this conversation is this. Jesus was instructing his disciples about how to handle people who commit sin. For example, he said, if your brother sins, go to him in private. If he repents, then you've won your brother over. If not, bring witnesses and so on and so forth. So Peter was merely following through on this whole conversation. But here, Peter asked something a bit more specific and personal. He asked, what should I do if my brother sins against me? How many times should I forgive him? And he said, up to seven times, Lord. You know what? In the Jewish culture, their law required them to forgive up to three times. So Peter was actually raising the bar. Now, why he was raising the bar, I don't really know. Maybe he was trying to impress Jesus like, hey, Jesus, up to seven times, that's times two plus one. Oh, ha, oh, ha, Jesus. Well, folks, Jesus was not impressed. And the truth is, no one can raise the bar higher than Jesus. He said, I do not say to you, forgive seven times, but 70 times seven times. Now, Peter was a businessman, a fisherman. 
I don't know how good he was at mental math, but I'm sure he was trying to do it in his head. But the whole point of Jesus is this. Don't count. Don't keep score. And it was Jesus' way of reminding Peter and his disciples, and by extension, you and me, that we are to operate on a different plane, especially when it comes to this issue on forgiveness. And so Jesus launches into a parable to show us once again how the divine economy of the kingdom of heaven works. Now remember, a parable is used to make people think. It compels people to think for themselves, what does this mean to me? Where am I in this story? How does this apply to my life? So let's see how the parable begins. In verse 23, this is what Jesus started to tell. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he had begun to settle them, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. So now we see the cast of characters in this parable. There's a king or a lord, as he is later called, and then there are his slaves. But there's specifically one slave. And it says here, when he began to settle them, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. Folks, I am sure when Jesus told Peter and the disciples, you must forgive 70 times 7, their jaws must have dropped. And when he told them this parable and revealed that a slave owed his king 10,000 talents, their jaws must have dropped again. Why do I say that? What is the big deal of 10,000 talents? Okay, let's try and understand this. 10,000 talents. First of all, what is a talent? A talent during Jesus' time was a unit of weight and thereby also a unit of money. So this is not about singing or dancing or stuff you see on TikTok or as we would say in the Philippines, uh, tumutulay sa alambre. What is that in English? Uh, bridging the wire. Okay, anyway, you translate it the way you want. But that's what a talent is. It's a unit of weight and a unit of money. So one talent is 6,000 denarii. Okay, now track with me here. One talent is 6,000 denarii. One denarii is a worker's daily wage. Therefore, one talent is a worker's wages for 6,000 days, which is roughly about 20 years if you remove you know, sick leave, vacation leave, etc., so what is now 10,000 talents? Remember, this is what the slave owed the king. So 10,000 talents, ladies and gentlemen, is a worker's wage for 60 million days. Now, remember the point of Jesus. When he told Peter and his disciples 70 times 7, his point was not to do the math. His point was, do not count, do not keep score. It's the same thing with 10,000 talents. The point is, the slave owed the king a debt which was beyond calculation. It was inestimable. It was incalculable. As a matter of fact, the word for 10,000 is where we get the English word for myriad. The real meaning of that word is it's countless. It is innumerable. So the slave owed the king a debt which was incalculable. What happened next? But since he, the slave, did not have the means to repay, his Lord commanded him to be sold along with his wife and children and all he had and repayment to be made. So folks, it is very clear. The slave did not have the means to repay. So we see very clear in the story. There's a slave who owes the king an amount of money that is beyond calculation, and he clearly has no way to repay it. So here, the lord or the king simply wants to 
cut his losses, recover even a little bit of that debt by having the slave and his wife and his children sold and all that he has. What happens next? This is another jaw dropper. So the slave fell to the ground and prostrated himself before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will repay you everything. Now, can I ask you, knowing what we already know about this story, do you think this slave will really be able to repay everything to the Lord or to the king? The answer is obviously not. So here is where the jaw dropper, jaw dropper number three comes in. In verse 27, it says, And the Lord of that slave felt compassion and released him and forgave him the debt. Folks, the word compassion means to be moved in your insides to the point of action. And obviously, the king here took action. What was that? It says, he released him. The word released here means to set a captive free. And I love the way this phrase is made. It says, forgave him the debt. To forgive means to let it go. Forgave him the debt. Folks, what is the relationship between forgiving and being in debt? Well, first of all, let me ask you another question. What happened to the debt? Did the debt magically disappear just because the king forgave the slave the debt? Of course not. Somebody has to absorb the full weight of that debt, right? Now, let me ask you, who was the one who took upon himself the weight of that outstanding debt? Of course, it was the king himself. So what is this parable all about? Is it about owing money? No. Remember, the conversation between Jesus and Peter and the disciples was about forgiveness of sin. So as I asked earlier, what is the connection between this story about owing money, an incalculable amount of money, and the issue of forgiveness? Well, let me explain. Do you remember the prayer pattern that Jesus taught his disciples? Our Father in heaven, holy be your name. You remember this part? And forgive us our debts. Of course, other translations, our sins, our transgressions, our trespasses. But the whole idea is this. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. We need to realize that sin is a debt. It is a spiritual and moral debt that we owe God because of our disobedience to his commandments. And just like the parable implies, our sin debt is incalculable. So I'd like to share with us three priceless principles that we can learn from this parable today. The priceless principles are number one, we owe God big time. As I said, our sin is like a debt to God, a debt that is so big, we have no means to pay it ourselves, no matter how sincere we are and how hard we try. Therefore, Jesus paid our debt one time. Now, Jesus is the king of the kingdom of heaven. And just like in the parable, it was the king who took upon himself the full weight of that debt. And when you and I understand that we owe God big time, but we cannot pay it, therefore Jesus paid our debt one time, therefore we must forgive, we must forgive other people all the time. Remember, 70 times 7. It is beyond calculating. We should not keep score. So let's go through these priceless principles one by one. Let's go to we owe God big time. I decided to put a visual of a mountain here for a particular reason. 
recently I watched a documentary about mountaineering. And in that documentary, I learned that there are 14 mountains or summits in the world that are at least 8,000 meters high. And expert mountaineers will tell us that once you reach 8,000 meters, you are in what they call the death zone. Now, you and I, because of sin, we owe God a mountain of debt. And spiritually speaking, that mountain of debt that we cannot scale, that is incalculable in terms of its height, brings us into a spiritual death zone. What do I mean? Well, the Bible tells us this. In Romans 6.23, it says, For the wages of sin is death. Well, let me ask you, what is a wage? Or maybe I should ask all of those who earn a wage, do you deserve your wages? You'd probably say, of course I do. Some of you may even say, I deserve even more. Well, you see, that's the definition of a wage. It's something that we receive, something we deserve in return for something we do. But in the Bible, it says, the wages of our sin is what? Is death, meaning it is what we receive and deserve in return for our sin. And the word death here is not just the end of life. The word death here talks about separation. Separation, as it were, of the spirit from the body. But more than that, it talks about being separated from God for all eternity, forever. And even elsewhere in the Bible, as in the Old Testament, it says the same thing. Look, in Isaiah 59, verse 2, it says, But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. What are the implications of these truths that we have just read? Well, let me explain them to you. Can you imagine being stuck forever in a place where you know for a fact God is not there? Where you know for sure that his face is turned away from you and where he does not listen to you? Well, folks, that is the separation that we deserve because of our sins. Now, some of you may be wondering, you know, what makes sin so bad? I mean, I haven't committed any crime. So why should sin be so serious? Well, folks, I'll give you one reason. And that reason is because sin is against a holy God. What do I mean when we say sin is against a holy God? Well, among God's many attributes, one attribute we see repeated many times in the Bible is his holiness. Let me show you an example. In Psalm 5 verses 4 to 5, it says, For you are not a God who takes pleasure in wickedness. No evil dwells with you. God cannot tolerate sin. His holy nature cannot coexist, cannot be in the same room with wickedness, with evil. That's why you and I could never enter heaven, enter into the presence of God based on our own merits because we are sinful. Now, again, some of us may think, well, I'm not as bad as that other person. But look at what the next verse says. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. Meaning to say, you and I will never have enough reason to say that based on our own righteousness or merits, based on our own goodness, we could stand before God. Because the moment we think that way, we are being boastful. And very clearly the Bible says, the boastful shall not stand before your eyes. And finally it says, you hate all who do iniquity. But you said, I, I, I thought God loves me. Yes, he does. But the word hate here means to regard as an enemy. And indeed, even in the New Testament, in the letter of Paul to the Romans, we are told that because of sin, we have become God's enemies. That's why we need to be reconciled to him. 
we are unable to reconcile ourselves to God. Now, when I think of the holiness of God, I am reminded of this other passage. Here in 1 Timothy chapter 6, we read, He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Now, read this. Who alone possesses immortality and dwells in unapproachable light. Wow, what a picturesque description of God. Who alone possesses immortality and dwells in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see. To him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. You know, when I read this particular passage about God dwelling in unapproachable light, I am reminded of the Son. What do I mean? Well, first of all, I recall uh, having a video call with one of my grandchildren. She's seven years old. She's based abroad. And so we were having a video conversation. And I said to her, hey, you know what? Uh, how can you get into a spaceship and go to the sun without being burned? And so she said, how, Lolo? And I said, we will go at night. She did not laugh. <laughs> but anyway, folks, why do I think about the sun when it comes to God's holiness? Well, our friends at the Bible Project, they use the sun as an illustration of God's holiness. They talk about the sun having incredible power. And from that power, we, de we derive blessing. We derive goodness. Uh, even life itself. And yet, we cannot even look at the sun, much less come close to it. Because if we come closer to the sun that is safe, we'll all be burned to a crisp. Folks, both Old and New Testaments talk about the holiness of God. Let me show you from the Old Testament yet another description, a depiction of the amazing holiness of God. In Isaiah 6, verses 2 to 3, it says, it describes a heavenly vision. It says, Seraphim, and Seraphim are angelic super beings. It says, Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two, he covered his face, and with two, he covered his feet, and with two, he flew. Meaning to say, even these uh, angelic super beings, they could not gaze upon the holy presence of God. Their feet, could not be planted on the same ground where the holy God was enthroned. And what would they do? They would say, one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Holy, holy, holy. It's a statement of superlativity. It is for emphasis, meaning to say God is sacred. There is no one like him. He is set apart from all of his creation. And then in the New Testament, way towards the end in the book of Revelation, we see how people in heaven respond to the presence of our holy God. It says in Revelation 7, 11, And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. What did they do? And they all fell on their faces before the throne and worship God. Such is the holiness of God, my friends. I remember I had a few conversations with my late wife about that picture of falling on your face in worship before a holy God. And she told me several times that if she were to see Jesus face to face, she was so convinced that there would be no more appropriate response than to just get on her face and worship him. And I believe last April, when she went to see Jesus, she had the opportunity to do just that, to be on her face before the throne of our holy God and give all of her worship. What is the implication, though, to you and to me that God is holy? 
when it comes to the issue of sin, the issue of this incalculable debt of sin that we owe God. What is the implication? Let me show you. In James chapter 2, verse 10, it says, For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point, he has become guilty of all. So let me ask a simple question. How many sins does it take to be separated from God forever? According to this verse, only one. But folks, let's face it. Remember, our sin debt is incalculable. Maybe some of you were asking yourselves the question, how in the world did that slave accumulate such a huge debt to the king? Well, folks, we can ask ourselves the same question. How have you and I accumulated such an incalculable debt of sin towards the king of kings? Well, let me ask you, how many times have you and I sinned in this life? Do you know how many times? I don't know. The number is incalculable. Besides, you and I know we have sinned much more than just one time. Here's a menu of sins that you and I have probably committed. Okay, take your pick. Galatians 5, 19, 21. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these of which I forewarn you just as I have forewarned you that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So folks, it is very clear. We owe God big time. And we are incapable, just like that slave, no matter how hard we try or how sincere we are, we are incapable of repaying that debt. Therefore, what is the solution? The solution is Jesus paid our debt one time. Aren't you glad Jesus came that first Christmas and eventually fulfilled his mission on earth? How do we know that Jesus really paid our debt one time? Hey, the Bible says so. Look, 1 Peter 3.18. For Christ also died for sins once for all. How many times did Jesus die? Once. For how many sins did he die? For all. Why did he do it? The just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. As we said earlier, we are incapable of reconciling ourselves to God based on our own merit. Therefore, we had to be reconciled, it says, so that he might bring us to God. Do you realize that from the very moment Jesus stepped out into his public ministry, his goal, his mission was very, very clear. Why do I say that? In John chapter 1, verse 29, the next day he, he meaning John the Baptist, saw Jesus coming to him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. From the very beginning, Jesus' mission was very clear. Jesus was the climax. He was the culmination of all of those years of the animal sacrificial system where the Jews would offer unblemished animals for the taking away of sin. All of that was just a foreshadowing of the true Lamb of God who finally came that first Christmas. And when he stepped out into his public ministry, his mission was declared to the whole world. Behold, the Lamb, the unblemished Lamb, the holy, set-apart Lamb of God, whose mission was to take away the sins of the world. And this word or this phrase, takes away, is actually very beautiful. It means to take upon oneself or to carry what has been raised, you know, to carry something with you and to take it away, take it out of the way or even destroy it. 
And remember we said in the parable, it was the king who took the full weight of the debt upon himself. And when Jesus was on the cross, he was continuing to express the reason why he came to earth. In Luke 23, we read, But Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots, dividing up his garments among themselves. Author and speaker Lee Strobel, who, by the way, will be with us in IDC 2022. I hope to see you there. When he referred to this verse, he was commenting that Jesus didn't say, Father, forgive them only once. The way that this sentence is constructed is that he kept on saying this over and over again. Meaning to say, as the nails were being driven into his hands, he would say, Father, forgive them. As the nails were being driven into his feet, he would say, Father, forgive them. As they were hoisting up the cross, he would say, Father, forgive them. As people passed in front of him and made fun of him and spat on him, he would say, Father, forgive them. And just before he gave up his last breath, this is what Jesus said. In John 19, 30, Therefore, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. This is an amazing declaration. I'll explain to you in just a moment. It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Folks, what are the implications of Jesus' final declaration that it is finished? Let me explain. Those three words in English are actually only one word in the original Greek. And that one word is tetelestai. Now, sources tell us that the word tetelestai would be written on business documents or on receipts in the New Testament times to show that a bill had been paid in full. The word tetelestai also implies that a goal was achieved or a task was fulfilled to perfection. Indeed, Jesus came and fulfilled his mission to pay our sin debt one time with his life. So what are we to do in response? Remember the conversation of Jesus with Peter and the disciples before he went into the parable? He said, forgive 70 times 7. So the implication to you and me is this. Remember the third priceless principle. We must forgive all the time. Do you realize we only read 50% of the parable? There's another 50% just about to come. But that slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii, which is a hundred days wages, a, a tiny amount, a minuscule amount compared to what the first slave owed the king. And he seized him and began to choke him, saying, pay back what you owe. So his fellow slave fell to the ground and began to plead with him, saying, have patience with me and I will repay you. Sounds familiar? Of course, it's what the first slave pleaded with the king. But look at how different the response of the first slave was. But he was unwilling and went and threw him in prison until he should pay back what was owed. Can I ask you, how do you feel towards this first slave? Are you starting to feel like maybe angry at him, asking yourself, how could he be so harsh to a person who owed him so little when he was forgiven so much? You got the point. But the point is this. There are times when you and I can be like that first slave. Remember, we talked about heaven's priceless gift, the gift of forgiveness, a priceless gift we all desperately need a priceless gift we are happy to receive, but which, unfortunately, there are times we find it difficult or even we refuse to give it to others. So what happened next? So when his fellow slaves saw what had happened, 
they were deeply grieved and came and reported to their Lord all that had happened. Folks, this is really inevitable. When there is one or more persons who refuse to forgive, who hold a grudge, who bear ill feelings, who have unforgiveness, bitterness, anger towards another person, there will be others that will become deeply grieved. It's called collateral damage. Whether it's members of a family, whether it's employees in an office or business, whether it's members in a church, wherever there is unforgiveness, there will be people who will be deeply grieved. In verse 32, it says, Then the king said, Summoning him, his lord said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave in the same way that I had mercy on you? It's a rhetorical question. Of course, the answer is yes. But what was the consequence? And his Lord moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until he should repay all that was owed him. And then here is Jesus' conclusion. My heavenly Father will also do the same to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from the heart. What are we talking about here? What are the implications to you and to me? Well, let me try and explain. According to Dr. Bruce Wilkinson in his book, 70 Times 7, which is really all about forgiveness, a torturer is someone who causes a person distress or suffering. Folks, many times when we refuse to forgive others, we think that we are in a position of power. We think we are punishing the other person and making him feel miserable. But the truth is, in God's divine economy, God will allow you or me or whoever is unwilling to forgive to feel miserable until we come to that point when we will obey Him and forgive the way we have been forgiven. You see, even secular sources confirm this. Take a look at this excerpt from an article. This is from an article written by uh, the Johns Hopkins Medicine Group. The title is Forgiveness, Your Health Depends on It. It says chronic anger, so uh, harboring a grudge, ill feelings, etc., results in numerous changes in heart rate, blood pressure, and immune response. Those changes then increase the risk of depression, heart disease, and diabetes, among other conditions. Now get this. Forgiveness, however, calms stress levels leading to improved health. It reminds me of one of our leaders who told me his story. He was telling me that he came to a point where he realized there were many people in his life that he had not forgiven. And he realized just how miserable he was as a consequence. He told me that he was so stressed because he had to pretend, you know, on the outside that he was okay. He was so stressed because he tried to avoid being in the same room with these people. He would also try to convince himself and justify his unforgiveness. He had no joy. He began to feel burned out. He eventually spun into depression. He even became physically sick. But when God opened his eyes, and he finally forgave all of these people from the heart. He was set free. And he was even healed from his physical maladies. And so our memory verse, our application verse for this entire message is this. Ephesians 4.32. Read this with me now. Be kind to one another tender-hearted, forgiving each other. And here's the kicker. Just as God in Christ also has 
forgiven you. Just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. And you know, you think about that first slave who refused to forgive. And you might think, did he really understand the forgiveness that he was offered? And when you and I refuse to forgive others who have hurt us, maybe we need to ask ourselves the same question. Do we really understand or have we forgotten the tremendous debt that we owe God and how Jesus paid that debt one time? So my friends, Jesus said we must forgive from the heart. How do we do that? Here are some guidelines that may be helpful to all of us. To forgive from the heart means we forgive all offenses without limit. Remember, 70 times 7 means don't keep score. Number two, forgive all offenders without exception. Do not seek personal revenge. That is God's department. Vengeance is mine, said the Lord. And do not take their sins against them. Don't get historical and start digging up people's past offenses. Now, here are a couple of clarifications that may be helpful as well. First, forgiveness does not mean there will never be consequences or boundaries. Sometimes, and you need to pray for wisdom about this, sometimes the most loving thing that we can allow a person to experience are the consequences of his wrongdoing so that he will learn his lesson. And letter B, forgiveness may not automatically result in reconciliation, but reconciliation should always be the goal. Now, I'm sure there are many of you who are thinking this. You're looking at these guidelines like just number one and number two, and you're saying to yourself, that sounds so difficult. You know what? I not only agree that it's difficult, I will tell you it is impossible. Unless you and I personally experience what it means to be forgiven of our incalculable debt because Jesus paid that debt for us, we will not be able to do any of these things from the heart. So I want us to be encouraged through this testimony. You're about to hear a story about a young lady who was so deeply hurt and offended by someone whom she trusted. And yet, eventually, throughout all of the pain that she lived with, when she learned about how she can experience forgiveness herself from God through Jesus, she was able to forgive that person who deeply, deeply hurt her. Please have a listen to the story of our sister, Lynn Bernales. I am Lynn Bernales, 41 years old. I'm the fourth of six siblings and I'm the only girl. I grew up thirsty for attention and longing for the love of my mother. I was a month old when I was rushed to the hospital because I could hardly breathe. My father desperately wanted to fight for my life, so he pleaded with the doctors to do everything they could to save me. After five hours in the emergency room, my life was spared. For my father, it was relieving, but for my mother, it was a bitter moment because the hospital bills emptied out their savings. As a result, we moved to La Union and lived there. My father and grandmother were my foundation and source of love. Sadly, I only felt bitterness from my mother. Every day, she would recount the story of my time in the hospital as if blaming me for everything that had happened. Because of this, I started to harbor anger toward her in my heart. I felt like she could love me no matter what I do. When I was 10 years old, an unthinkable happened when I was left alone in the house. I was raped. My abuser threatened me that he will kill my mother if I were to tell anyone about it. This incident caused my more anger in my heart towards my mother because despite knowing she has ignored me, I still did not want anything to happen to her. I kept silent about the incident because I still love my mother and I fear for her life. 
Fear was eating me up because I was also afraid that people might not believe me or would not accept me anymore if they find out about what happened. I was already suffering in so much fear when my abuser did the same thing again after a year. I was full of rage but felt so helpless. Right after I graduated from elementary, my pains grew even more because my father left us for an unknown reason. I felt so alone and that I no longer have a father to defend me. Because of this, I decided to leave our house and never wanted to return. I lived with my grandmother and moved from one relative to another. When I was 15 years old, when I met the Lord, my aunt brought me to a youth gathering where I met the Lord, my love and knowledge of the Lord grew. Hearing about His grace and love for the Word and His people captivated me, so I accepted Him as my Lord and Savior. I began attending seminars, different trainings, and went on mission trips to share Jesus to others, especially to the youth. After graduating from college, I started attending JSON, the Youth Ministry of Christ Commission Fellowship back then. That was when I heeded God's calling to attend a training for youth servant leaders. God spoke to me through the words in Ephesians 4.32, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. His message was clear. It was then that I surrendered every anger, bitterness, and pain that I harbored in my heart for a long time. The Lord opened my heart to forgive those who hurt me, even if they have not yet asked or will never ask for forgiveness. I am humbled to have experienced the same grace of forgiveness as I too also learned to forgive myself. Having lived and being in bondage with anger, pain, and sufferings most of my childhood, I too received the same grace that I was able to extend to others who have hurt me. It was on November 5, 2005, when I found out that my father had cancer. By God's grace, I was able to accept my father back completely. Despite him abandoning our family, I never had the courage to neglect him when he needed me the most. I left my job and took care of him. I stayed by his side until God took him home by the end of that year. Although I prayed to God if he can grant us more time to be together to make up for the lost time, God has other plans. I took care of my father in the last two months of his life and that was actually enough to show him that my love for him was never lost. It was the overflowing love of God for me that I was able to give the same love to my father. I also learned to forgive my mother with whom I have a much better relationship with. We, have, we would often talk on the phone and say I love you to one another. Above all else, God also blessed my heart the strength to forgive the person who raped me and to even share the gospel to him. Before I came to know Christ, I never imagined myself returning to our house that alone forgave those who had hurt me. But because of Christ's forgiveness and His love that I experienced, I was able to love and forgive them as well. I praise God I came to know Jesus at an early age. God's amazing orchestration made all the anger and the hurt that I went through to be used as an instrument to this demonstrate the love of Jesus Christ to my family and to other people. Now, I am faithfully serving God in Gabay Salandas Foundation or Gala. I now minister to children who were also abandoned, neglected by their parents. Some of them were also abused. I use my story and breakthrough to help these kids and other people to learn how to forgive through the love of Jesus. My life was full of fear, hopelessness, anger, and bitterness. God has replaced all of them with love, hope, and freedom. To the God who loves and offers hope and forgiveness be all the glory. Praise God indeed, Lynn. You have been through so much, but through your experience, we also learned so much. Your story reminds me of a very specific quotation and your story tells me that this quotation is oh so true. What quotation am I talking about? To forgive is to set a prisoner free and discover that the prisoner was you. This was true in Lynn's life. This can be true 
in your life as well. So folks, how do we wrap up our time together? Let's go back to our priceless principles and make sure we apply them. What are they? Number one, we need to admit that we owe God big time. Number two, we need to accept that Jesus paid our debt one time. And finally, as we personalize these and as we allow them to be true in our own lives, number three, apply, we must forgive all the time. My friend, we want to bless you. We want to help you. We want to help you end this year right and move into the next year without any unnecessary excess baggage in your life. If you've never come to a point where you have admitted you owe God big time, if you've never come to the point where you've accepted Jesus as the savior of your soul, as the one who paid your sin debt for you, you can do that right now. And for all of the rest who are listening, we will also have a time of prayer where we will commit to the Lord that we will apply what we learned, which is to forgive all the time. Shall we pray together? Let's join our hearts in prayer. Our Father and our God, we thank you for the forgiveness we have in Jesus. And I want to pray right now for anyone and everyone who's listening, who's watching, who has not yet come to that point where they admit that they owe you big time and that they are unable to pay that debt on their own merits and they need to receive Jesus and experience His forgiveness in their life. If that's you, my friend, will you join me in a simple but humble prayer? Something like this. Just tell Him, Lord Jesus, I owe you a sin debt that I cannot pay. But I thank you that on the cross, you declared it is finished. And so, Lord Jesus, today, I give you my life. I believe in you as the Savior of my soul, the one who paid my incalculable sin debt. And I receive you into my life to be my King, my Lord, and my Master. And Lord, help me. Help me to live a life that is pleasing to you, a life that is truly transformed for your glory, honor, and pleasure. And now, Lord, I pray for all of us, whether we have received you only today or whether we have experienced your forgiveness even in the past, I pray that we will be faithful, diligent, and by your grace, always able to forgive anyone and everyone who has offended us in any way so that it will bring glory, honor, and pleasure to you according to your command. Thank you again, Jesus, for the year that has passed and the year that is coming. May we live every moment of our lives for your honor, for your glory. This we pray in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen and Amen. We pray that this message has blessed you, has spoken to your heart. And will you allow us to bless you by connecting with you? because that would also be a blessing to us. You can chat with us, you can follow the instructions at the bottom of the screen. And by the way, if you are with us for the very first time, or you feel you'd like someone to pray with you and for you, we would love to bless you in that way as well. Please visit our online welcome center. Again, the instructions are at the bottom of the screen. You can join us by Zoom, you can join us by chat, whichever way. We would love to bless you and help you transition into this new year with a heart full of forgiveness and joy. In the meantime, please stay tuned for Sunday Fast Track and our discussion questions. Everyone, an advanced, blessed new year to you and to your families. You just heard a message from the Word with Christ's Commission Fellowship in partnership with Far East Broadcasting Company Philippines. Until next week, God bless you.